the 2022 Nobel Peace Prize of Laureate, uh, human rights attorney, uh, Alexandra Madvechuk is chair of the Center for Civil Liberties. Thank you for speaking with us here on France 24. You just heard our correspondent say how it's a shock for the for the for the west uh, of Ukraine. But be it Lviv or Kiev, where you are, uh, the air raid sirens blare, but life has returned to a semblance of normal most of the day. Your reaction after this story? It's the uh, next uh, deliberate Russian attack to residential buildings and peaceful cities uh, in Ukraine. And it shows the vulnerability of Ukraine. We still need more air defense systems. And even more, we need F-16 just to be able to close Ukrainian sky and to prevent such kind of attacks. You need F-16s, uh, Ukraine, which is currently mounting a counteroffensive without uh, the supremacy of the skies. We cannot wait. Uh, let me tell you a story of Volodymyr Vakulenko, children writer, who was disappeared and killed during Russian occupation in Kharkiv region. And when this territory was liberated, we found only the grave with number 319 with his body. And we are fighting for not just for territories, but for people. Uh, we can't leave our people alone for torture and death. We have no time to wait. Alexandra Matvyuchuk, uh, your job since February uh, the 23rd uh, has been to document uh, what's been occurring. W what does that entail? We have now in our database more than 42,000 episodes of war crimes. And 42,000, it's a huge amount, but still a tip of iceberg. Because Russia uses war crimes as the methods of warfare. Russia attempts to break people's resistance and occupy Ukraine by the tool which I call the immense pain of civilian population. And just to be clear, we are not documenting violations of Geneva and Hague conventions. We document and work with human pain. With human pain, what does that mean? It means that we document war crimes when Russian troops deliberately shell in residential buildings, schools, churches, hospitals, attack evacuation corridors, manage filtration camp system, organize forcible deportations, commit murders, tortures, rapes, abductions, and other kinds of offenses against civilians. So what I want to emphasize is not just violation of provisions of international humanitarian Law, it's horror, which become a part of our daily life. When you see the efforts underway to set up some kind of an international uh, war crimes uh, tribunal, what are your expectations? I expect it from political leaders of different countries of the world, historical responsibility and courage, because for me, as a human rights lawyer, it's important to investigate and to prosecute all people who commit these crimes by their own hands, as well as Putin and senior political leadership and top military command of Russian state. But as a human being, I want to stop these crimes to commit, because it's still going on. And justice has such possibility, because when we start uh, establishing of special tribunal and aggression, it will hold a signal. It will send a signal like a frozen effect to brutality of Russian violations, because they're so sure that they will avoid responsibility, because they enjoyed impunity for decades in Georgia, in Chechnya, in Mali, in Syria, in Libya, in other countries of the world. Alexandra Matvichuk, uh, before the war, uh, you were fighting for uh, civil liberties, for human rights uh, in your own country. What to do with collaborators who've been caught in areas that have been retaken by the U Ukrainian military? A lot of them have yet to face trial. Ukraine has to provide um, predictability for people who live in occupied territories. And that is why Ukraine changed last year our 
legislation just to name what is this collaborator means and for what people will be punished and for what not. Because it's also used by Russian propaganda. They strengthen people on the occupied territories that all of them will be punished just because they are living there. And this is not true. People who committed crimes will be prosecuted. People who try to, to survive under unbelievable circumstances will never be prosecuted. Are, are you... Uh, how is the Ukrainian uh, justice system uh, holding up in, in, in that regard? Is due process effective uh, for those who are accused? Like, I will respond generally, because uh, this type of crimes committed with other types of crimes in this war, uh, which uh, Ukrainian state officials have, have to investigate and to prosecute. Just to you to understand the scope, uh, Ukrainian Office of uh, General Prosecutor opened more than 92,000 criminal proceedings against war crimes. And this is a huge amount. As a human rights defenders, we always criticize uh, law enforcement bodies, our judicial system, because we're still nation in transit and a lot of has to be done. Uh, to reform these uh, institutions and to make them more effective. But in these circumstances, like, I, I can't say nothing because 92,000 criminal proceedings, it's impossible to investigate even for the best national system in the world. And that is why we need international assistance. Like, France sent us in April last year, France Gendarmerie, to work in Kiev region and help with identification of dead people in mass graves. But it was temporarily. It was only in one region. We need such assistance on the constant basis. Need for the assistance uh, throughout the country. Alexandra uh, Matvichuk, thanks for being with us and, and offering a perspective on, on a conflict that, of course, the whole world uh, has been uh, watching uh, for the last uh, year and nearly year and a half. Um, let's stay with us because we want to take a look at uh, the rest of uh, just the day's events, which sometimes uh, beggar belief. Uh, there are also Russia's internal rumblings after that aborted march on Moscow by Evgeny Prigozhin's Wagner mercenaries late last month, Belarus's president now claiming that uh, he no longer has Prigozhin on his home soil, that he's gone back to Russia. Charlie James has that story. Where is Yevgeny Prigozhin? The Wagner mercenary leader was believed to be in Belarus, which welcomed him as part of a deal to end his June 24th armed rebellion. But Thursday, Belarus's president, Alexander Lukashenko, revealed Prigozhin is actually in Russia. As for Yevgeny Prigozhin, he's in St. Petersburg. Where is he this morning? He might travel to Moscow or he might be elsewhere, but he's not on Belarus's territory. Lukashenko also claimed Prigozhin is a free man and that Russia will not wipe him out. Belarus is said to have brokered an agreement with the Kremlin in which Prigozhin ended his march toward Moscow in exchange for security guarantees for himself and his soldiers. But now those guarantees seem uncertain. Criminal charges against Prigozhin were dropped last week, but pro-Kremlin media has started attacking him. Russian state TV reported Wednesday that an investigation into the insurrection is still being vigorously pursued and labeled Prigozhin a traitor. Outlets have also published photos of Prigozhin's mansion in St. Petersburg, allegedly full of weapons, gold bars and wigs. Russian security services raided the mansion. However, the Kremlin claims to not be tracking Prigozhin. We are not monitoring his moves. We have neither the ability nor the desire to do so. Last weekend, all Wagner Group signage was removed from its former headquarters in St. Petersburg as the Kremlin began its takeover of Prigozhin's corporate empire. 62-year-old Prigozhin has not been seen publicly for nearly two weeks.
We're in the company of uh, Alexandra Madvichuk, uh, Nobel Peace Laureate, who's with us uh, from Kyiv, human rights activist. Here in the studio, uh, we're with our Europe editor, Armin Georgian, and from our international affairs desk, uh, Douglas Herbert. Uh, uh, Doug, the, uh, the latest in the uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin uh, saga now, uh, lots of questions. Where to begin? What with uh, the, the, uh, uh, the claim that he has gone back to Russia by Alexander Lukashenko. Uh, he's, he seems a little bit like the, the metaphor being sort of a greased pig in a, in a university because dormitory. We, we, you can't we have, get your hands on him. He keeps slipping away. We've heard Lukashenko, we've heard, sorry, Prigozhin twice on these audio messages on Telegram, the latest one right. this, this past Monday. And significantly, you just said the keyword audio messages. We have not had video messages, which previously had been his daily routine, almost daily habit, uh, releasing them. Look. The one thing we can say is there's tons of speculation. You rightfully say so. No one has categorical answers. You know, people say, oh, he's under the control of the FSB. Uh, Russia has him where he wants him. He's negotiating his fate. Putin's deciding what to do with him and how to handle the remaining Wagner fighters. Or Lukashenko uh, is in control of him. He knows what he's doing. There's a — we don't know. What we do know, though, is that he is definitely still a loose cannon, a loose cannon in the sense of if we are to believe the reports that he has gone back and forth from Belarus to Moscow or from Belarus to Petersburg several times over the past week or so, uh, that would suggest that his freedom of movement means that no one has absolute control over him. Uh, you might be asking the question, a lot of people are asking that question, well, you know, and, and, and Lukashenko has asked the question, well, why haven't they just, is he dead? Ha, you know, has Putin, uh, in the parlance of uh, the convicts, has, has Putin whacked him? Uh, and, you know, Lukashenko shrugged that question off today, said, no, you know, you think you, you have this image of Putin, this stereotypical head, that he's vicious and vindictive. He's not out to, to, to whack him, um, which leaves that question, that outstanding question. So how is it he's able to come and go? Now, some reports, St. Petersburg local press, Russian reports have said that perhaps he's, uh, you know, he went to the, the, the FSB headquarters uh, in, in Petersburg, walking into those headquarters. What's he doing there? Was he getting back equipment that had been confiscated after his mutiny? Was he negotiating uh, his future? His fate still obviously is undecided. Putin has been trying to present the facade, the front, that he's in control, that he's incorporating Wagner into the Russian army. Nothing to see here. Move on. But what's very but clear it, it, from these events is that he's still a moving target, Prigozhin, and he's stunned someone that they do not have complete control over. That, I think, is the lowest common denominator here, no matter what the speculation may be. All right. Uh, Alexandra Matvichuk, when you, you awoke on Saturday, the 24th of June, and you heard about uh, the city of Rostov uh, uh, being uh, in, in, being held by uh, mutinous uh, uh, irregulars. What were you thinking at the time? I can't understand what's going on in details. Like a lot of other, there are different versions and possible scenarios. But what was visible for me that Putin's regime is much more weaker than we think about it, and this means that we have to make a strategy towards Russia. What will happen if, uh, in, like, something uh, like this uh, will succeed uh, in, in Russian uh, state? And as they know, there is no such a strategy in the uh, international community, and this is a problem. Well, there is to a degree in the sense that we, we had these reports that uh, uh, the United States was communicating in through back channels uh, with Moscow to make clear that they, they didn't want uh, some kind of unruly regime change. W what are your thoughts when you, when you saw those reports? It's not United States who will make uh, the reality in Russia. It's, it can happen without desire of UN. The, 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 uh, Vladimir Putin is weaker than he seems, like you say, but uh, did people maybe get a little bit ahead of themselves uh, when, they, when they saw this mutiny start and then suddenly stop? The problem is that for years, um, and even for decades before, in, during Soviet time, people in Russia were get used to so-called phenomena of Lord helplessness. A lot of people really believe they can do nothing to change uh, this, the state of affairs in their country. 
So that is why I'm not expecting uh, something from a uh, general public. And the general public uh, in, inside of, uh, of Russia. Let's turn our attention to uh, Ukraine's president. Volodymyr Zelensky is abroad. He's in Bulgaria before heading to Turkey, uh, the president uh, visiting Black Sea neighbors ahead of the NATO summit and as a grain export deal looks once again in jeopardy. Uh, Armin Georgian, that first stop, Bulgaria, what's it all about? Well, uh, Bulgaria is interesting because uh, it uh, didn't make big statements uh, about weapon supplies to Ukraine, but in the first months of the war particularly, it was a major indirect supplier of weapons uh, to Ukraine. But the other thing that Bulgaria had um, was this political crisis, and that crisis gave a space, in a sense, for... Uh, certain political forces to rise. There was a, uh, a pro-Kremlin party that got bigger uh, share of the vote in, in various elections. You also had these Eurosceptic forces that were against joining the Eurozone, for example, that were also on the rise. Now, Bulgaria has a coalition government and it is uh, expressing uh, support for uh, for Ukraine, not as a caretaker government, but as an actual... Uh, so what you're saying is Russia's government. invasion of Ukraine has shored up uh, pro-EU sentiment. Well, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the declarations in the Bulgarian parliament today, th there's two aspects which I think are interesting. One is... Uh, saying that, uh, that Bulgaria should continue military and technical support for Ukraine. The other thing, and this is perhaps more striking, is a declaration of support for Ukraine to join NATO once the war is over. That, I think, is a pretty striking aspect of what the Bulgarian parliament said today, given that there are in Bulgaria, these voices that say we should be neutral, we shouldn't, so to speak, take sides. And yet you have the Bulgarian parliament coming up with this sort of declaration. Douglas Herbert? I was going to point out, you know, Zelensky really was uh, encountering what you might say is a, a split screen Bulgaria, a Bulgaria uh, whose very leadership, right, the president, Rumen Radev, uh, versus the prime minister, Nikolai Jankov. Now, Nikolai Jankov, the prime minister with whom Zelensky met today at first, uh, is very pro EU, is very pro NATO. NATO, um, and has made that affinity uh, for Ukraine and helping Ukraine and probably ramping up the support as much as he can very clear. Zelensky and Denkov, the prime minister, very much see eye to eye. They are on the same wavelength. But there was a much more hostile meeting, you might call it uh, a showdown, a confrontation, if you will, with the president, Rumen Radev. And that's interesting because he's more of the old school. Uh, and this is a president who has been, uh, to say he's lukewarm to NATO, I think is an overstatement. He has uh, been very, very uh, almost hostile to NATO at times. And he has been outright dead set against supplying arms, which Armin was just saying uh, uh, Bulgaria has indirectly been doing, to supply applying military aid to, uh, to, to Kiev to help in the war effort here. And they're really up against that. So what, what it's reflecting here, Francois, at the end of the day, is that divide in Bulgarian society. There's still, especially the older generation, still very much a historical, deeply harbored affinity for Russia. Russia as a historical friend, historical benefactor, even if among a lot of the Bulgarian population today, especially the younger ones, the political support and the political sympathies do not lie with Vladimir Putin, but much more with Ukraine. But the older Bulgarians, I think it's really important to underline, they still very much are sentimentally and emotionally attached to a more positive image of Russia, if not of Vladimir Putin. They even might remember the historical episode of the Tsar, Alexander the second chasing the Ottomans out of Bulgaria back at the end of the 19th century. Alexander uh, Matvichuk, uh, does this mirror uh, what we've seen since 2014 uh, in Ukraine, a country that was split the, in its sympathies at the time? Uh, today, when you look at Russian-speaking Ukrainians, uh, is, it a still, is there still that generation gap? It's very visible. Look to Ukraine armed forces. Uh, Russian speaking Ukrainian joined voluntarily Ukraine armed forces in a huge amount after 24 February last year to defend our country, our people, and our democratic choice. Because we are different people with Russia, uh, we subjected to force forcible Russification for centuries 
uh, being a part of Russian empires and a part of Soviet Union. But the main value for Ukrainians, according to all sociological survey, is freedom. Uh, what are your thoughts on the controls on uh, Russian language books? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on that after the Russification that occurred in the past? I think that Ukraine, as a candidate country to join EU, uh, have to provide democratic reform and, trans and change in our legislation in order to achieve parallel several goals. First, to, to uh, develop and secure Ukrainian language like any other countries uh, do with their own uh, state language, and also uh, to provide um, ability to national minority uh, to study and um, do other uh, rights uh, uh, on their own languages uh, as international standards are set. Alexandra Matvichuk, it's been more than a year. This counteroffensive uh, is in its early days. It's a hard slog uh, for those who, who are at the front. How are you doing personally? How's your morale as we head into, as, as spring becomes now summer? I will never wish any nation to go through our experience. It's horrible. Yesterday, we buried my closest friend, Ukrainian writer Victoria Melina, who was hit by a Russian rocket in a cafe in Kramatorsk. Uh, doctors fighting for her life for all this period, but unfortunately she died. And now in counteroffensive for us, it's first of all numerous deaths in battlefield. And it's very pity that we not receive appropriate weaponry to which can save these lives. Now my Facebook, uh, turning to the constant posts about on memory of our fallen heroes. And what's that message then uh, to those uh, NATO leaders that are meeting in Vilnius next week? My main message is that Ukraine has to be to become a part of NATO, and Ukrainian people expecting uh, decisive actions during Vilnius summit. Ukraine will not be just a beneficiary. Ukraine will be a huge contributor. And we prove it not just by words, we prove it on the battlefield. Ukraine will make NATO stronger. Alexander Matvichuk, so many thanks for speaking with us uh, from Kyiv. I want to thank as well Armin Georgian and Douglas Herbert. Thank you.